Welcome back, America. Chew Hewitt. Water, water, water everywhere. Lots of drops to drink, but what's in it? That's the question raised by Seth Siegel, whose new book, What's Wrong with What We Drink, titled Troubled Water. That's the full title, Troubled Water. Debuts this month. It's on sale at Amazon.com. You know Seth because he was here. He's been here many times. Let There Be Water, his bestseller that I have uh, probably recommended more than any other book in the last three years. Seth Siegel, welcome back. Good to have you, my friend. Hugh, thank you so much. And by the way, I think that that is correct. I think that you liked uh, my book uh, more than my wife and children might have. Uh, so well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's just fascinating reading. Let There Be Water remains my, my recommend, but now Trouble Water is going to join with it. By the way, you deal with my home county. I, you know, I live inside the Beltway now, but when you're Chapter 9, why can't we all have water like Orange County? Yep. You're talking about my home, and the fact is the Irvine Ranch Water District, the Orange County Sanitation District, a lot of districts in Orange County have absolutely a stand, uh, established the, the standard of care. That's right, and I'd like to make believe like I actually was uh, trying to suck up to you by writing that, but uh, I, it, I was searching for a happy story in what is mostly a dismal one. And unfortunately, it, with the startlingly large number of water utilities in the United States, most listeners, if I wanted to do a quick quiz, they would say there's 50 of them or 200 of them or some number like that. There's over 50,000 water utilities in the United States. And of that extraordinarily vast number, which creates mayhem and confusion and inability to move forward, there are only two or three that are, that are really cutting edge in technology. And your home county of Orange County is the gold standard of the entire United States. And so it was really an honor to go and dig in, do the research on how they got to do that, because I'm hoping it will be, I'm hoping the book will be an inspiration for policy change and activity change in the United States, but I really think that Orange County will end up being the model for utilities far and wide. Except for one thing, Seth, let me discuss this with you. It's into the weeds, and I want to get back to the big picture of troubled water, which is the importance of clean, safe drinking water everywhere in the world. Orange County has many, many water districts. Some of them are state-of-the-art like the Irvine Ranch Water District. They have billions of dollars in reserves, billions of dollars in reserves. But there are hundreds of water districts in California. After I read Let There Be Water, I realized we need one water district per state. We cannot have this multiplicity of people, this multiplicity of standards. We've got to have prioritization. We can't balkanize our water. Hugh, I could not agree with you more. I tell you something. I wrote the book. Uh, because I thought it was an important story to tell, and I, I'm not writing it for just a bunch of scientists or government officials. I write the book for the average reader. I like to say that any intelligent 11th grader with no engineering or science background could enjoy and understand the book. But my policy prescriptions are a few, and they are, I think, important. And the, one of the three or four of them that I make is exactly the point you're making. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, over 50,000 water districts or water utilities in the United States. This is creating a problem where there's underinvestment, where you can't recruit top talent. And, and if we could reduce it to, say, one estate or two or three in a very large state, you know, maybe by region, and we would have a total number of 200, 300 utilities in the whole United States, then they would be able to recruit talent. They'd be able to get the capital that they need to introduce new technologies and to fix the, the, the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of miles of broken water pipes around the country that are costing us in our health and in our pocketbooks. So, so you, you put your finger very quickly on one of the two or three most important things we could do. Now, interestingly enough, two years ago, I wrote Scott Pruitt an email. My, my law firm represented the Orange County Water District, which has a super fun site. It's the poor people's water site, of course. In Orange County, there are poor people. They have a water district it's centered in Anaheim where most of the people who are under income, it's not my water, got nothing to do with me, but I wrote on behalf of one of my partners, Scott Pruitt, please meet with these people to expedite the cleanup of this super fun site that affects the water that these people drink. That became a scandal. That, that got Scott Pruitt in trouble. I, I, I made no money from it. It wasn't my client. It just it was a firm client. I don't understand why super funds involving our water are not priority. Do you? Well, no. I, I, well, I do in a sense after several years of research and hundreds of interviews I do, and, and that is because of the fact that we have this really broken bureaucracy around our drinking water uh, nationally. The priority, Hugh, unfortunately, is not public health. And also, the, the, the governing philosophy is not efficiency. What we have is this kind of crazy cost-benefit analysis that we're using 
on a locality by locality basis and by a and in terms of super funds they have this prioritization program where you get something higher or lower on the list and, and therefore something can linger for many many years with all kinds of health implications for the community that it's in such as the community you just mentioned right now this this is exactly what has to change it has to become focused on public health and one of the reasons i argue in the book that the epa has just lost its way uh, it, you know, people keep saying to me, you have to have a villain in your book, and I don't really believe in villains. I think we should all work together for good outcomes. But, but if there's, if there's a, somebody who's definitely lost their way, it's the EPA. And one of the arguments I make is that if EPA can't get around to focusing on the needs of people like in Anaheim or around the country, all of us, then we should move it to another part of the federal government, like the Health and Human Services, that will have a pro-health focus. Now, I've got to, again, separate a little bit from my friend, Seth Siegel, because Scott Pruitt was doing that and he got run out of office. Andrew Wheeler, the current EPA director, has said that a thousand people a day die because of impure water around the world. It should be our number one priority. He got hammered by the climate change people saying you're ignoring climate change. Yeah, well, you know, something. I am not. Um, let, me, let me tell you where I am on all this whole thing. And I, I get asked this question probably more than any other single question. I do a lot of public speaking. I speak to audiences all over the country. I've been in, I've been in almost seventy cities and about thirty states now since I wrote "Let There Be Water," and I expect to do something similar around troubled water. But I'll, but I'll tell you something. The problem about climate change is that, of course, it is a large and vexing problem. I don't know how exactly to address it, but I do know how to address drinking water problems. And I think that we should be able to say that, yes, there are large problems out there. We'll, we can think about them. We can try to fix them. We can try to get consensus around them. But that does, that's not an excuse for inaction. That's not an excuse for us to slow our pace in trying to stop thousands of people from getting sick, having their endocrine systems, their hormonal systems disrupted by, by drinking water contaminants that we know are in the water and we're not doing enough about. And so we should move forward at the same time on, on both these things. The other thing I want to say, Hugh, very quickly is that one of the worst things about this whole climate change phenomenon is the degree to which it's polarized the country. You know, it's become almost a morality play. And one of the arguments I make in, in Troubled Water is that drinking water would, would be well served if we would stop thinking of it as an environmental issue because then people retreat to their respective political camps. And that we should instead think of it as a public health issue, and that's a way in which everybody can get their arms around it. And then it becomes a question of cost and efficiency and not ideology. I 100 percent agree. I also want to emphasize a theme in both books. We don't know what we're doing to our water because we are flushing medication that passes through our bodies, whether it is the birth control pill or antibiotics or pain relievers or fentanyl. We're passing that into the water system. And our water systems are not built to get rid of that impurity. In Israel, they are. But you first alerted this to me. I would not be surprised, Seth, if we look back in 100 years and find that many of the maladies that have arisen in the late 20th and early 21st century are related to just that problem. Well, you know, Hugh, uh, th thank you for remembering that I raised that in, in, in the first book, Let There Be Water. I, I, I want to tell you something. It was an interesting phenomenon. What happened was... Um, I was finishing the first book, and I couldn't get out of my head the fact that uh, this very respected, world-renowned scientist said to me, do you realize that you're drinking your neighbor's uh, uh, discharged pills? And I didn't understand what he meant, so I called him up. I, I, I finished the interview. I called him up, and I said, can we have a second interview? What, what did you mean by that? Yep. And he explained to me, and I'll explain it to your listeners quickly if I could, is that that, you know, America, since about 1950, has been very much medicalized. Before 1950, very few people took pills of any kind or had injections of any kind. And since 1950, we've become very much medicalized. And to the point that now, this is a statistic that's shocking but true, 70% of Americans at age 12 and over take at least one prescription pill a day, and 20% of Americans 12 and over take at least five prescription pills a day. Now, with that mountain of daily medication, what happens to it? You would like to think that all of it gets metabolized properly, but in fact, as much as 90-some-odd percent of every pill never hits its intended target, and it, you, you discharge it either in the toilet or you sweat it out, and so it gets into the shower or the, or the washing machine. And our wastewater treatment plants, and I don't mean to get too wonky here, but our wastewater treatment plants that were built, say, starting in the 1920s or 1950s, but even the more recent ones, most of the time, use the old technology, 
do a very good job of getting rid of what's called organic waste, you know, the, the poo in your toilet bowl kind of thing, this chicken scraps that you wipe down your, that you flush down your kitchen sink. But it does nothing whatsoever. Nothing. For, nothing for what's called inorganic matter. So that, it's crazy. So that, it's, it's scary. Crazy. It's crazy. So we've changed our society. We've changed the society, but we haven't changed our technology to address it. So what happens is all of this gets into our wastewater. It gets flushed into our rivers and our lakes. And more than 40 percent of all Americans, it's confirmed, more than 40 percent of Americans are drinking the discharge of their upstream or d- down lake neighbors every single day. So they, the water then is drawn out of the river, it's drawn out of the lake, it's, it's chlorinated, so it kills off you know, any kind of bad guy bacteria kind of stuff that has grown in the water, but it does nothing whatsoever for these inorganic compounds. So, so if you, if you, you know, and, and I'll get to the, the punchline, by the way, it's not just that it's disgusting, it's exactly the point that you made, which is that, uh, that lots of the scientists that I interviewed said there isn't peer-reviewed articles yet to say this, but one after the next said to me that they are positive that links will be found to a whole wide host of changes in the way society is right now, whether it's from, from autism to, to, um, to obesity to diabetes to other issues that I well, actually don't want to get into here because it's too controversial, that, that they believe that these changes are coming about because of the endocrine disruption that's coming from these pills that are getting flushed down our toilet bowls. And while, while moms who are expecting routinely stop drinking alcohol because of disruption to the fetal development, they don't stop drinking water. They don't. No. And no, so they... I, I, I just tell people they should read both of your books, Troubled Water. I want to conclude this on this. I read an essay on the Midwest yesterday and why we're so open-handed. I'm a Midwesterner. And I came out because I'd read Troubled Water. I think it's because we have water abundance in the Midwest. As a result, we're not threatened by water, whereas the rest of the world is threatened by water. We've always had water, which means we've had food, which means we haven't had scarcity in war. Where there is water, there is peace. But increasingly in the world, there is not enough safe drinking water, and there's going to be more conflict. 30 seconds, Seth. Agree or disagree? I totally agree. And by the way, even in the Midwest, which is fed largely by the Great Lakes, I have cutting-edge research that came out literally weeks before I finished my manuscript, which shows that more than half of all the fish that were taken in a randomized survey out of the Great Lakes had in their brains and in their organs all kinds of really bad uh, um, uh, psychiatric medicines in them. And why is that significant? Because the only way it could have gotten in there is through the wastewater treatment process of America. We've got to fix that. We've got to have a pro-health a national system. We've got to fix our number of utilities. And if we do that, we can have a much, much healthier national framework. And I believe, by the way, that this is a bipartisan issue, that once we alert Americans to this, once we alert your listeners to this, we can get the outcomes we deserve. You'll get the information you need from Troubled Water. Troubled Water is in bookstores everywhere. Come back. Seth Siegel, Troubled Water, like Let There Be Water, a must-read. A must-do, America, is relieffactor.com.